Our guest today is Phil Dunn, a director, writer, poet, and owner of Authentive, a production company based in Brixton, South London. Now, through Authentive, he learned on the job, making hundreds of films for clients in the corporate, charity, fashion, and music sectors. And his first short film, Box Office Smash, marked a jumping off point in his career, garnering official selections at top international film festivals, winning 14 awards and critical acclaim. Then his next short film, About, continued this momentum, winning the same number of awards and obtaining equally impressive reviews, propelling him further into the world of cinema. His newest short film, The Stupid Boy, is powerful, it's moving, it reaches down into your heart so deep that it will leave an impression on you like no other film. And The Stupid Boy short film is Oscar qualified to be considered for a 2024 Academy Award, and rightly so. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the cinematic creator of The Stupid Boy, writer, director, Phil Dunn, to the show. Welcome, Phil. Hi, Ward. Thank you so much. It's very kind of you to have me on. Uh, well, I'm pretty excited about uh, about this new short film, The Stupid Boy, but I've got to ask you something. How did you go from medicine to theology to filmmaking? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. And uh, it's definitely one that I've, uh, look, you know, looking back on it, you can maybe make more sense of it than you, you can at the time. I think a lot of my family might have been looking on thinking, what on earth is Phil up to? But yeah, I studied medicine first at, in London. And um, that was really because my father was a doctor. And I just thought it's such a noble profession. You could save lives, you know, uh, what, what better could you do in the world? And um, but I soon realized that it wasn't really for me. And I think that's the important thing is to find where you fit and what, what's right for you. So I uh, looked at theology. I've always thought a lot and very deeply about a lot of things. And uh, theology sort of matched up with that and understanding what makes people tick. And as I studied that, I found out, you know, really it's about the stories throughout history, throughout the millennia that have inspired and connected with human beings for better or for worse but that have met, found their way into the human story and, and still are around today even thousands of years later so uh, it was during that time I started playing with film and that whole thing about story and all the different techniques that they use in the bible to tell a story um, that uh, and and in, and in other religious texts as well I, I began to want to tell my own stories too and um, began to try and do that through film uh, well, so for my dissertation, I made a film. Oh, really? So, <laughs> wow! What in in uh, in theology school? In theology, yeah. They 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 wanted a, an essay of twelve thousand words, uh, but they said, "Be creative, please." We we were so bored of having to read all these things. So I thought, okay, I'll hand in a, a DVD. It was at the time of a half hour short film, and. Um, that's what sold me on the whole filmmaking thing. Everything from writing all the way through to the final edit and showing it in a cinema at my university, I just it just it just set my heart alight. So um, I kind of had the bug from then on. Well, I love that. I mean, was there any particular films that you have seen prior to that that kind of planted that seed? Oh, I mean, so many. Uh, I remember, you know, one of the first films, uh, I, two films that jumped to mind immediately. One is The Ch uh, Chariots of Fire. You know, I think if you were an English, uh, an English, a young English um, kid growing up back then, that was such a powerful and amazing film. And I remember, you know, that moment where Eric Little falls to the ground and everyone runs past him and he gets up and somehow, you know, still wins the race, that kind of thing. I just did that ability for film to really inspire you and to give you a story that stays with you. I mean, I've thought of that so many times throughout life where things go wrong and you think, you know, and it's that whole thing. It's not, you know, the falling down, it's the getting up, it's going, getting back, going for it again. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's films like that that really stuck with me. Um, yeah, another one would be Gandhi. I watched that when I was young and I remember that just leaving such a huge impression on me, this amazing man and his life. and. Um, how would I have really got into that story um, any other way? I'm not sure I would have sat down and read a book about his life, but, you know, it, it, it touched me. You bring up two films that this younger generation have not seen, and most yeah. of them have probably have never heard of either film. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, 
you know, when I talk to filmmakers, you know, we bring up things like Jaws or The Godfather. Yeah. But Chariots of Fire, that is true cinematic art. And it's not just yeah. the storytelling. It's the music score. Uh, it's just the cinematography, the way that it's done. It's pure yeah. film art. And yeah. Gandhi... Uh, well, that that's just a biopic that is just that everyone needs to see. But both Bunch. both films have very powerful meanings. Did you pull a little bit from either one of those in making the stupid boy? Um. Oh wow. Well, I mean, I I think so. I mean, I would say for um, Gandhi particularly, uh, one of the sort of central themes in the stupid boy. Uh, really is this is this idea particularly for the last scene the final scene uh, no spoilers but you know there there one of the reasons one of the sort of key inspirations for that was this idea of non-violence um, and uh, I remember studying that when I was studying theology I remember that that but that originally came from watching Gandhi that film where we you saw these I Indians standing in front of their oppressors and walking towards them but without any act of violence, they weren't trying to, and, and being beaten down by people, police with sticks and all sorts, but they just kept, got up and kept coming. And, and then I, I, I subsequently read about that with Martin Luther King as well. I, there's something about that just completely, it's so from another world almost, you know, completely stuck with me. And that was, I think that was one of the main reasons why I had this idea for this film was wrestling with that, I, like that concept of, like not being violent, but still somehow standing up to uh, to violence and to oppression and to evil, but without violence. It's it's a it's a fascinating idea. The 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 picture that enters my mind as you're as you're saying all of that is the famous photograph of Tiananmen Square. Yes. With, with yes. the one person standing there in front of a tank. Yeah. That yeah. to me exemplifies the stupid boy. Oh, thank you. Wow. And That's because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this film, The Stupid Boy, as I said before, it's powerfully moving. So, Phil, for, for the audience out there, explain what The Stupid Boy is about without giving the spoiler. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Stupid Boy, it's about a, a neurodivergent teenager who's growing up in a London where there's been a spate of white supremacist uh, suicide bombings. And um, uh, he, like many people, you know, uh, is growing up in a, it's, it's a fearful place. It's, uh, there's, there's sort of terror on every corner, as it were. And, um, but he sees things differently because of his neurodivergence. And... Um, at the same time, we, we follow uh, this other character, Stephen, who is a broken man in sort of late 30s, who has had a pretty or, or tough experience of life, experience of abuse when he was younger, and is being groomed by this Christian white supremacist group. And um, yeah, essentially, these two uh, parallel narratives finally converge in our last scene. Yeah. Now, what inspired you to write this story? I mean, you studied theology. I picked that up a bit in the film. Uh, so uh, in what ways did it help you to uh, write and direct it? Yeah, I mean, for me, again, um, theology is a fascinating, you know, it's, I've never been that excited by religion, um, but I've always found human beings really exciting and interesting. I'm fascinated. I've always been a people watcher ever since I was a kid. I was always that kid just staring rudely at the at people at the other table. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, for me, it was a real little, like looking into kind of what makes people tick, um, what what is under the surface, you know, seeing beyond the kind of religious uh, side of things. I think particularly with when it comes to terrorism and, uh, you know, re religious extremism, uh, it's very easy to go, well, it's because of their religion that are doing that. And my one of my goals in this film was to see past that to the human being that why why does one of the things i want to get my head around was why why would anyone want to strap a bomb to themselves and then try and blow themselves up and other people with them like what leads to that point and obviously there's lots of different ways that someone could get there and none of them are nice but no to try not at all some <laughs> humanity a bit yeah yeah and what i loved 
was the double perspective of this film. There are two sides to all worldviews. I mean, especially what we're seeing happening in Israel. But people with very strong and passionate beliefs, they can convince themselves that they're right. I mean, like the character Stephen in the film. And not only did you nail that character, I thought naming him Stephen was a very (laughs) good choice biblically. Biblically. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. Was that done on purpose? Yes, it was. Yeah, I think the more you'll, f- I think what I love about cinema, and this is, I'm so it's so nice that you you talked about it as being a cinematic film. Um, I, what I love about cinema is that if you if it's such a it's such a beautiful medium because absolutely every piece of it can mean something if you let it, and you can work with every part of it to speak something to the viewer, whether they realize it or not. And um, and there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that, obviously, but it can be incredibly powerful. So, you know, the color that someone is wearing or the fact that they are drinking a cup of coffee or or, or a whiskey instead, of, you know, that will tell you something about that character immediately. And and yeah, that that name uh, was definitely, you know, Stephen in the Bible is uh, he, he was one of the first martyr in the New Testament. So, um it led quite nicely to the way the, the guy who's grooming uh, Stephen, uh, it sort of helped confirm what he was thinking. Well, you know, <clears throat> when he, when the gentleman uh, in the white supremacist group asked him, well, what's your name? And the yeah. moment he said Stephen, and I went, oh, that's oh. good. And then the <laughs> other character looked at him and he was thinking the exact same thing. Like, oh, yeah. this is great. But in a way... That, I guess that leader of the white supremacist group, he used that to feed more of his own belief into yeah. the Stephen character. He he basically used it as a manipulative tool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think, again, from my studies of, of religion, unfortunately, you know, that is how religion has been used so much throughout history. It's been used to control people. And it's been used to manipulate people into doing um, the religious authorities or whoever whoever sets them out sets themselves up as an authority to do their bidding, and 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 it actually becomes very little to do with God at all. And that's where you know, as far as what I understand is God, which is God is really you know people talk about the universe, it's, it's talk about love, and that's what this film says in it. It's very clearly like God is love. Like if we can't agree on anything else, let's. And even the word God is a difficult one to deal with. Love, we all agree about. It's, it's, import, it's important, it's powerful, and we all want more of it in the world. So let's unite around that. <laughs> well, yeah, because when... I, and I love the scene where uh, the boy is sitting in the kitchen at the table yeah. and his, his, his mother's getting things ready and his, his father's doing something. And then he asks them, you know, why, why do they always yell glory to God uh, be, before they uh, blow themselves up? Yeah. And to see the different reactions between the mother and the father, but then have the father sit down to try to explain to his son, because his son looks at the world as everyone's nice. Yeah. And so he's not understanding why people do these things. But when his father was explaining him just explaining to him in a way what it means i love the fact that you had the character write in his journal and he wrote god equals love and when i saw that i went he picked up something completely different than what his father just told him yeah yeah which which i thought was which i thought was beautiful oh interesting yeah yeah i mean that's the thing i think for him it just it really uh, from Michael, it really clicked because he has this particular view of the world. Like you said, he he is a very loving person, and he and he believes the best of everyone. It seems, and so when he hears the idea that the, the, you know we're talking about God, um, but when he hears the idea that God is love, he's just like, well, that makes total sense. And for him, I, I, that's a, one of the details. There was he writes it in the margin of his maths exercise book, 
uh, and he writes God equals love as if it was alongside a bunch of other equations on that page. It's it, For him, it's as, as clear as that, just God equals love. It's like one equals one, you know, it's just, it's it's obvious to him. And, and I love that. And, and for me, you know, that, that reflects something that I feel, you know, part of that character is totally me. I am this stupid boy who still believes in, in love, that actually love is, you know, and it sounds so cheesy and it can sound so fluffy, but love is an incredibly powerful thing. And that's part of what I wanted to show in this is it's not this fluffy idea. It's actually got real power to it. It's really, it's a, it's a strong concept, not a, not a fluffy weak one. Yeah. And I mean, and, and I love the way that you open the film. You know, Ed, it for probably about a minute or so, there's no dialogue, but you see uh, Michael playing uh, with his uh, homemade camera, uh, yeah. or viewfinder in a way, and yes. uh, and it shows that he he's looking at the world through his own lens. Yes, that's right. Which I thought yeah. was a which was a very powerful introduction into the film. Because from there, it really started to, I mean, my gosh, I mean, I'm surprised that this is not a feature film. <laughs> <laughs> because it's amazing how you can pack so much meaning into a short film and mm. you did it brilliantly. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was definitely quite a process of, it was a much longer film originally. It was, it was probably about three times as long as a script when I first wrote it. And I, I worked really hard on that script. To, to, I got a lot of feedback. I sent it to a bunch of people. I'm really open to, to try and you know, see what, what worked for them, what didn't. And I managed to get it from like 35 pages down to, I think we shot with 12 in the end. And uh, so, so yeah, every, again, it was something I think Martin Scorsese said, I watched his masterclass. He's, he's awesome and a, a real champion of real cinema. And you know, he said, he, one of the things he said is that every, frame counts and everything that you see in the frame and in a scene has to like take that story forward in some way and i really tried to put that like to the test in this like every single thing that i'm not gonna have any sort of uh, extra in there it's got to just each each single second of this every frame of it's got to count and take a story forward so yeah we had we ended up covering a lot of ground in only 15 minutes but um, what well, i mean yeah. There, there is a, there's a moment in the film and I, and I really don't want to give it away because I, because I believe that it leads to the end, but sure. when his mother is taking Michael to school yes, and there's, there's a, there's a, there's a short scene, uh, at the entrance of the school yes, and it didn't dawn on me until I was started putting two and two together. I went, Oh, so Michael's yeah. action towards that teacher, yeah, leads to something, and I don't yes. want to don't want to give it away because, ladies and gentlemen, this is a film that if we sat here and explained it and <laughs> dissected it, we would give it away. But you have yes. to see it so you can actually experience it. So I want to be very very careful. But I want to ask you, Phil, because it still yeah. boggles my mind, and because you studied theology. Yeah. It boggles my mind that there are hate groups out there that feel using God as a way to justify their evil behavior. Yeah. And you portrayed that element in this film. Did you research white supremacy groups for this film? Yeah, I did. I did to some extent. I, I, you know, it's a short film, so I didn't go too deep on things. But what I found, one thing that I did find that as I crafted this character that really um, blew me away was I spoke to someone who uh, works in the legal side of national security here in England. And um, they, part of um, uh, their job is to track um, ter potential terrorist cells. And um, so, uh, you know, when you say terrorist cell, I don't know what images come to most people's heads, but you know we've been given a certain stereotype. Let's put it that way. And um, what was really interesting to her, to me, when I spoke to her, I said, you know, do you think is this plausible that we could have a, a white supremacist terrorist like this in England? She said, you know what, out of all this, out of the, the number of cells that we are tracking in the UK, there are more white nationalist extremist cells than there are 
of other backgrounds. And um, that was, for me, I was like, that's not what we're told. Uh, so it was it was shocking to me. But I also thought, it, I had thought that it must, you know, I thought in that direction that it was plausible and that this could be happening. But to actually have that confirmed by someone who actually really knows was uh, mind blowing. So yeah, it, uh, and then, yeah, a lot of the rest of it came from, you know, again, my own experience of uh, religion and seeing people using religion to manipulate people and to and to fulfill their own agendas. Thankfully, not not to anywhere near an ex as extreme uh, uh, a level, but I, I have seen that um, through my own experience as well. You know, and I'm glad I'm you know after watching the film and pondering on it for a while, I was really glad that the villain was not. Muslim or Middle Eastern because yes. it wouldn't have the same effect. And then the film would have just fell into a, a stereotype that the media yeah. creates for the most part. Yeah. So yeah. by not going that route, your film is much more powerful. It's much more believable. And I think it engages the audience, all audiences. I think it engages them more to actually watch and see what actually transpires in this film. Thank you. Yeah, that was my hope. And I think, you know, I was very aware of obviously post this film, the first idea for it came to me after the 2005 terrorist attacks in London. And, um, and so I was very aware. Then after that, we saw lots of films and lots of TV where there was a Muslim bomber uh, because that's what, what we had experienced on that day, Muslim Islamist extremists, and um, and it just was it was just would be it would be too easy to just roll out that same trope again. And actually, the problem with that is that then people just go, oh well, we know all about those, so they just they just pigeonhole it straight away. I know exactly, so you don't need to tell me any more about. And the whole point is like no, but the whole point was we need to understand why a human being would do this, not why a Muslim or his Islamist extremist or a, or a, a white supremacist, extremist, but it's actually trying to get to the human being. How does a human being, because that's what they are, how do they get to that point? That's an incredibly sad story, but we need to get our heads around it as a society if we're going to be able to help avoid those things from ever happening. Now, did you play with different character developments when writing the story? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. There were a few different, uh, few different ways of coming at it. And actually, the, the the character of Michael in the in the early early drafts. I mean, I must have done about twenty twenty five drafts of this story, uh, really trying to find a way to do it justice. You know, really, um, but the the first couple of drafts, um, there was it was a little girl actually in there, and um, and uh, actually some of what Michael sort of fulfills in his role was actually was done by two different characters, a little girl and um, I forget who else. So, so yeah, it, it's interesting how you sort of, again, just trying to find the best way into telling the story in the most succinct way as possible. Uh, you slowly sort of chisel it down to, to what's going to work. And well, yeah, he ended up embodying a few, actually, a few things all in one. Uh, he did. I'm going to, I'm going to ask you that here in a second, but with, and, I, and I'm just going to call Steven the villain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and you did, and you did this correctly. Uh, and I don't want to give the scene away, but you really brought him down for for the audience to focus on the human being. Hmm. There's a moment in the film; it, it's the most powerful moment. We focus on him as a human being. We don't focus on him as a white supremacist, uh, a Christian that's gone haywire. We just focus on him because then it has to be his acting because he brings that that character forth with such power and yeah. with such believability that you're only focusing on him. Uh, you're and actually you cause the audience to actually start to worry about him. Yeah. And that that is just a power. I mean, what was casting like for for your? Uh, yeah, we're so. I mean, that's Sean Mason, the actor there who played Stephen. He is he's incredible, and he's he's such a 
he's such a good, kind, sensitive soul, and I think that's that's why he brought such uh, reality to this character. He really wanted to understand who who that man is, just like I was trying to say, like, how does a human being get to this point? And and he really did that. Uh, we had he would call up and we had sort of two or three hour phone call uh, the day before shooting where he was just asking me every question. It was just like, this is so amazing that he's giving it this much care. It's a short film and he's done films like feature films. He's done TV. So yeah, we were very lucky in the casting. We had, we had, a, um, we had some help from a casting assistant uh, as being a short film. We couldn't get a proper casting, a full casting director, but we had casting assistant put together some lists from different, uh, you know, from the agencies. And then Gabby, our producer, Gabby Oliver, who's amazing, uh, did a lot of the approaching and talking and we got down to a short list. And um, yeah, I mean, once we saw, you know, I had different ideas about who would play Stephen, what they might look like. But once I saw Sean's tape, uh, it just totally stood out. It just and, and the same with Joshua, who plays Michael. He He's just an astounding actor. And um, he brought a level of nuance and and just the, the the tiny little details that you i mean you just pray you might get in a short film you know? well did joshua all right joshua griffin plays michael yeah. yeah did he create that character or is he neurodivergent <laughs> yeah. so well uh well both he he, he is neurodivergent himself he ha but but not very far along the scale so he's um he has add and he's also dyspraxic just kind of like, so a struggle with sort of space and movement in some ways. Um, so he is neurodivergent. He has a cousin who is autistic, fully autistic. So he spent a lot of time with his cousin, very close with him. So I think, you know, he was able to bring, he brought all of that to the part. So he, and again, like I said, it's just those little looks and the little, wet, his mannerisms more than anything else that just was like, wow, no one else is doing that in, in their self tapes. And uh, yeah, that's what, that's what really. Well, what, it, what, was it like directing him? Oh, it was a total joy. I mean, he he really when you meet him in person, he's a very um, very articulate. Very, he's a really lovely young man, and you know, he's a bit older than the character. And in fact, the character was until we cast him, the character was going to be fourteen, but we thought, well, we can't get away with that, so we made him sixteen because I think I think Joshua was nearly twenty or around twenty at the time. Um, but yeah, he's he's amazing, and again, just really, um, really professional. It's only his third short film, or I think, um, and so he's he's one to watch. You know, he he's going to go really far, that actor. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for his name. Absolutely. Now, I love the way Derek Elroy portrayed the father. Very oh, patient and wise in his approach of teaching his son, Michael. Uh, yeah. Why was that element important in the storyline where, you know, the mother seems a little bit uh, frazzled? Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, that, that for me was really important to have these sort of almost two, you know, your parents become voices in your ear, don't they? They, they have two voices at the shoulder of Michael. That One, who this loving father who's actually... Uh, believe believes in him believes that that maybe what he what his neurodivergence is rather than a problem it's actually a gift and what is that gift got to bring to the world and he kind of is curious to see what it can do and and then on the other hand there's his his mother um polly who's uh, who's concerned for her son, which any mother would be, and he's getting bullied at school and we need to do something and, and surely, like, we need to talk, to, the teachers should be doing something about it and he should be standing up for himself. We can't just let them get away with it. So I think that was really important to have that sense of, like, and it helps create the question around Michael of, like, it is what, it is, does he have a gift? And, and, in, and how can he use that gift in the world? And what, you know, well, yeah, how, how do we see him and how, how do we see that gift in the world? So, yeah, I think that was that was a really important part of it. And De Derek Elroy, um, he's had so much praise for this part, which is so lovely. He, he was he was so um, chuffed, you know, as we say in England, to be involved uh, and, and to, to get to play this kind of father. He said for him was just such a complete joy. Well, where did you come up with the idea of the, the cardboard camera? Ah, uh, well, that is, yeah, that's a good one. I think it was actually, you know, it's a friend of mine who is an, is an artist. Um, 
he's called Graham Little. He's, a, he's an extremely good artist and he's collected by people around the world. He actually, we were talking about it and he was saying, you know, perhaps they're doing, you know, this character's doing something kind of, you know, and we talked about what they could be playing with or whatever. And I think it was him who suggested this camera obscura. And for me, I was like, oh, there's something about that because it, it, for me, it spoke to me as a, as a person because I, I, I love playing with, cameras and I love looking at the world through a lens and and trying to understand it and I can think that's the role of films is doing that so it captured some of that and but it also was what what's amazing about a camera obscure is when you make one it's just it's just cardboard and a, and a bit of like um, transparent like film at the back and it, 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 there's no me mechanism there's no sort of electronics but you get this image on this little screen at the back of this cardboard box and it's upside down and and again, that was something for me. It was like this is this is such a perfect image to play with because he's looking at the world and he sees it through this box and it's upside down and it's like he can't figure out why. Why is it upside down? And I, I that just felt like the right the right tone to set. It was the perfect segue <laughs> to start the film because you have the, the you have the cardboard camera view, then yeah. you have Michael's view of the world, then you yeah. have. Steven's view of the world, which yeah. is extremely narrow, which is which mm. is funny because you have the cardboard camera, which is it's technically a pinhole. Yes. Michael's view is very wide, but yes. Steven's is very narrow. Yes. Uh, and I so was that on purpose? <laughs> Do you know what? That's that. I think no. I can't say that that was a hundred percent on purpose. But now that you said that, 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 that's a good angle. I like that. Um, yeah, definitely. I think and the, definitely the part of the the, the, the narrowness of the um, the camera obscura, the fact that it's looking at the world through a pinhole. Um, there was something about that for both characters that felt really important. Um, and and yeah, I think it, it's it's part of the question of the film, like who who has the more limited view of the world. And I think often with neurodivergence, the the the, uh, the tendency has been historically to sort of look at, at people who are neurodivergent and think, oh, you know, poor them or something. And it's like actually, no, we're starting to recognise neurodivergence is just an it's just a a different way of seeing and understanding the world that actually can be incredibly powerful. And um, and so yeah, so. Yeah, it's it, it, mm -hmm. it's yeah, but I, I like that you're drawing more from it. It's uh, that's what I loved about this film. I, I I'm still finding layers to it now. I'm thinking that your next short film may be called Pinhole. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> title. <laughs> yeah, definitely. definitely well, right. I'm, I'll note that down. <laughs> well, you you filmed this in Brixton, South London. Why did you choose that particular marketplace? Well, that was. Uh, a couple of things really um we uh, my production company authentic is based in brixton so we wanted to work locally we wanted to work with local people we wanted to give opportunities to local talent um in in the making of the film um but also um that environment you know originally i'd thought of this idea on a on a tube on an underground train in london and we looked at whether we could film one of those and they were like, well, the last people that did that were James Bond. So, you know, what kind of budget have you got? <laughs> so that ruled that out. Um, so then we, um, then we, yeah, we, we, I was looking for something that would provide a similar kind of sense of being enclosed, but also public. And, and then it was, didn't take me long at all because I used to walk through that market every day to get to where I had my desk. I was like, hang on a second this would be perfect. And, and it turned out the more we again went with it, the more, the more perfect it's, it, it's, it, it appeared to be because um, it turned out that it was, it's privately owned. So we didn't have to worry about, you know, we could get, we didn't have to worry about sort of police being on the scene to stop the general public. You know, we could just cordon off this private area, this private property and fill it with extras. And, you know, it, it just worked so well for us. And it also meant that we could, you know the people that catered for the shoot were the, the burger you see it in the in the in the in the last scene it's called Uwe burger and they're a vegan burger joint right in the middle of the village and and they got to cater for the shoot that was the deal that we did and they had you know i don't know 60 70 people to cater for that day and and some and guaranteed business so that was just it just made it all such a pleasure because uh, i'd met a lot of the people that run that uh, different stores in that market so to be able to kind of 
give back to it so so sort of immediately in that way um, as part of telling a, a, an important we felt an important story that was that was a really nice touch for us well yeah because what I liked about the location was is that it was narrow enough yeah. for the audience to focus on the characters and not have yes. their eyes span yes. the background 100%. you know because, and so your your attention is is focused on the characters you know you're, yeah. you're you're focused on there's three main characters in that scene i don't want to give anything away because th this is a film where you cannot give a spoiler alert people you've got <laughs> to see this film so yeah. but phil how long did it take you to film the short film uh this took us four days in total yeah so Okay, that seems about on average from what I've been hearing. And uh, what has been the audience's reaction to it? Oh, it's been it's been amazing. That's been the thing that's uh, really moved me throughout. The, it's been on the festival circuit now for a year, and um, uh, it's been incredible. That one of the the main awards we keep winning um, ha have been the audience awards, and um, just seeing. I've been trying to get to as many of these festivals as possible. It's the first festival circuit I've been able to go to. The previous one was during uh, lockdown, so that, that didn't work out. So um, being there and meeting people after watching this film has been such a, a privilege because people, you know, I, I, I had one person crying for nearly an hour after watching it and, and sat with her and talked about it. And you realize actually, you know, this is bigger than... I, this film came to me. It was something that I felt I had to make. It, I can't, you know, I feel, I feel like it, it wanted to make itself through me, you know. And so to see it then touching someone in that kind of way and seeing how important it was to her and it has been to so many other audience members, uh, that's been such a privilege. And you realize that this is, this is the importance of making art. You know, you put it out there, you let it come through you. And then it does something in the world and it's, and it's and this film's just gone crazy it's just a whole life of its own that i could never have predicted now the oscars baftas on the horizon it's just that's I, I you know and for me that's all about trying to get as many people to see it as possible i just would love as many people to see this because i really believe in what it has to say i mean for you how does it feel to be oscar qualified <laughs> and most well, likely yeah. i'm predicting bafta too uh, <laughs> well we 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 you know are like on the you know we're approved to, for BAFTAs as well which is great and um but yeah I mean Oscar qualified I I don't know I I you know once you think uh you know you're in the same category as like Wes Anderson with a short film this year and I think maybe is it Al modavar has got one as well <laughs> so these you know I've looked up to them for years so um, I'm just very happy to be in the conversation and, and, and more than that, I just really, whatever, whatever helps get more eyes on this film for me is, is what, I, again, I feel I'm working for the film. I'm here to like help it get to where it wants to go. And, you know, the Oscars, anything to do with the Oscars is going to help it, you know, find more people to, that it can be seen by. So, uh, that is again, a real pleasure and a privilege. And I'm just, I'm happy to be along for the ride. <laughs> you know, I, I I really wish that I was on the uh, the Academy's uh, committee to be choosing <laughs> the uh, the 15 short films yeah. that will be shortlisted here uh, coming up uh, this year. The competition has been stronger than ever. I'd almost yes. hate to be on that committee to to make those decisions. Yes, but your film. <laughs> is literally one of the most powerfully moving. Um, and, I, and I really want the whole world to see it because the message in that film is so strong and it's something that we all need to know. And I'm trying to be very careful because I don't want to spoil it <laughs> because it's that kind of film. But for you, you've had, uh, you know, you've had success at, at film festivals uh, what festivals uh, do you have coming up and what is next for you? Uh, well, at the moment we have, uh, we're in Mallorca. The, the, I'm not there, but the film is, again, it's sort of touring the world and doing this thing. Um, so it's at the Evolution Mallorca Film Festival, which is a really big one over there. Um, 
And uh, we're coming back over to America to the Ohio Film Festival in, I think it's, is it Northern California or it's in California? Um, I've been to Ohio, so I should know exactly where it is, but it's a beautiful place. Uh, so um, it's getting around still. Um, it's done some, it's done, I think, 65 festivals so far. Um, and it's won 39 awards, which is, it's just, again, just for, just been such an encouragement for us that, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I, part of this, this title for this film is, is what I felt when I first thought of it is like, oh, you stupid boy, th this will never work. <laughs> so the idea that now is, does seem to be working and in, in the, that many places, uh, is, is, a, is, it means a lot to me. Um. And then, yeah, what's next? Uh, I'm, uh, I have another short film that is ready to go. And uh, that's an exciting collaboration as a result of the people I've met on this festival circuit. So uh, a producer in LA, a dancer from Cleveland, who was at the Juilliard School in New York. And we're looking at shooting that in Cleveland and, and in South Africa. So that's an exciting thing. We're, we're still getting the full money together. So anyone out there who wants to jump on board, let us know. Um, and I'm writing two features as well. So that's really what I want to, that's, I, I'm hoping that, you know, come the Oscars, I will have uh, got one of those finished. Uh, that's my aim so that I can just get straight onto that. Um, after this, all of this wonderful, you know, train ride is, is over and, uh, and it's time to move on. So, yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, we'll see you part of the Oscar festivities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. The short <laughs> film, The Stupid Boy, is pure gold. I mean, the storytelling is superb. It will leave you a, it will literally leave you with a lasting impression on all who will have the opportunity to see this film. I mean, it's powerful. It's moving. It's riveting in the most unique of ways. And, and Phil, I want to thank you so much for sharing your film uh, with us today. Uh, I've been looking forward to, to talking to you once I saw the film, I was I was blown away. Oh, thank you so much, Ward. I really, really appreciate that. It means so much, and uh, uh, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, this is an example of like you are on the other side of the world. Here I am, and yet we found something that connects us and that we both feel something about. And uh, that's the magic of uh, of filmmaking. That's the magic of art. So I, I'm. It's, it's such a honor and a privilege to be, well, to be there. You, all, you always have an open door to the to my show, and when you get the two features done in the next short film, you got to come back, because I can't wait to see those bodies of work as well, and to discuss that with you. Uh, Phil, I mean, much success to you, and uh, we'll all be waiting to see who's going to be shortlisted, and if I'm going to be a little bit biased, I expect to see the stupid boy in part of that top 15 oh thank you so much i really appreciate that well we, we'll see and uh yeah i'm just so grateful to be in the in the mix <laughs> uh, you're definitely there and ladies and gentlemen you can watch the full interview uh with myself and phil dunn on our various online platforms and on my television show the ward bond show and please subscribe to our new online show bond on cinema the perfect place for film lovers to get an in-depth interviews with top film directors, producers and screenwriters, even actors, and so much more. So if you love the movies, you'll love Bond on Cinema. And as for me, I want to thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you next time.